get started. Thanks so much for coming tonight. We've got a really exciting presentation. Um, our presenter will kind of be in the middle of the room so everyone will get to see him here. Um, so just a reminder that tonight's presentation is being filmed both for Akaku TV, which will be aired later, and on Facebook Live, just so that everyone's aware. Um, and what we'll do is, I know you're famous. Um, this is the Maui Nui Marine Resource Council meeting. Thank you for coming. You're in the right place. Um, I just want to give a quick mahalo to our supporters for this, which should be the uh, County of Maui Office of Economic Development helped fund uh, some of this project you're going to hear about tonight uh, through Maui Nui Marine Resource Council and also Pacific Whale Foundation for hosting us tonight in this venue. Um, tonight we have Dr. Bob Richmond presenting on Dr. Doolittle meets CSI on the coral reefs of Maui. Uh, he is a research professor and director of Kavalo uh, Marine Laboratory at the University of Hawaii Manoa. He's a chair of the Maui Coral Reef Recovery Team, which is part of Maui New Marine Resource Council. Um, spent the majority of his professional career studying coral reefs in Micronesia, Hawaii, Japan, Central America, Galapagos. Where am I forgetting? That's pretty good. Wow. <laughs> um, his research interests are in the area of marine conservation biology with a focus on coral reefs. So without further ado, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks, Anne. So do I need anything to switch over? Um, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, so thank you all for uh, this evening. And uh, it's always a pleasure to come over uh, to Maui from Oahu. Um, your traffic's almost getting as bad as ours, but not quite. Um, I'll try to stay in the middle so people can see me. If I start, I don't like to stay in one place, especially after I had a killer scoop of chocolate ice cream, so I'm kind of sugared and caffeined up, so I'll wander a little bit, but I'll try to stay in the center. Um, it's a real pleasure to uh, come back to Maui. We do uh, research here as well on West Maui. Um, a lot of my work is tied into watersheds, and um, as a coral scientist who began this work, uh, back 44 years ago. Um, there have been a lot of changes going on and what I'd like to do is uh, give you an overview of some of the work that's going on that uh, takes advantage of new technologies, uh, but it's also a blend with uh, a nod to traditional ecological knowledge and the fact that um, a lot of what we know came from people who have been around reefs and that's why it's a real pleasure to be able to work in Hawaii and throughout the Pacific Islands because communities, practitioners here have a great deal of knowledge. Um, the problem is that traditional knowledge didn't have to deal with things like organophosphate pesticides, global climate change, and other things that we're seeing today. Uh, so my work will talk a little bit about some molecular tools, but don't be intimidated. Um, there's nothing that I do that people can't understand, and I'll try to do my best to make it clear. Um, I, before I go, I'd also like to point out that this is a collaboration um, with uh, a past graduate student of mine, uh, Dr. Kaho Tisthammer, who got her PhD in my laboratory, stayed on for a year of postdoc funded by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and as total payback, because some of the stuff I'll talk about today are techniques that the coral scientific community mooched from medicine. Um, the medical community mooched her back from me and she's at University of California, San Francisco, now doing proteomics on human diseases. Um, so that's payback. You be careful who you get a mooch from. So, um, first and foremost, since it's a pretty broad audience here, I'll accept that everybody knows what corals are in a coral reef. Um, but this is a close-up of the polyps of a coral, and we call this a profusion of polyps. That's the basic unit of a coral. But one of the things to understand about corals is they're liars. They're really, really, really bad liars. They lie about their taxonomy. They lie about uh, their distribution. They lie about their age. One of the things they can't lie about is their biochemistry. And as a result, in order to keep them honest, we've been trying to find out techniques to be able to connect with what's really going wrong with the coral. So if you really want to know if a coral's having a problem, you really need to ask the coral, not the scientist who thinks they know what's going on, because corals will do everything they can to confuse us. And so when I started working on coral reefs back in 1974 in the Caribbean, on the left side, we can see this beautiful Acropora palmata. And um, uh, on the Pacific, uh, below that, um, when I started working on reefs 44 years ago, typically the reefs I worked on had 80% coral cover, um, lots of fish, and were thriving, uh, provided great uh, resources to uh, the cultural communities that depended on them, uh, everything from coastal protection to fisheries. And unfortunately, if you look over on the right side, um, I went back to one of my reefs that I studied back in 1974 a few years ago, and that's what it looked like. 
it went from over 80% coral cover to less than 2%. Instead of large schools of fish, I saw one snapper that was about six inches long, and everybody got excited that I actually saw a fish. Um, areas in the Pacific likewise. So I'm not here to depress you. Um, you can just look at the news if you want that. Um, but what I will try to do is to give you kind of a, an optimistic view that yes, we have issues, and that coral reefs are in trouble, um, but they're threatened and not doomed. And it's totally up to us to determine what the future of coral reefs will be. Um, so when we talk about human disturbance on coral reefs, there's a pretty wide spectrum that we can talk about. Um, and the reason why I bring up this slide is this is actually where I did my doctoral dissertation research. This was a little bit before, before I got out there. But I spent two years at Anahuitac Atoll in the Marshall Islands, if people are familiar with that. It was the site of the nuclear testing program during the 1950s. And during my time there, um, when you consider the range of human impacts on coral reefs, uh, vaporization via atomic weapon is pretty far out there. Um, we have reefs that were literally vaporized off the face of the earth. And when you consider stressors, that's pretty acute. Uh, but when I was there in the 1980s, I was able to go back to some of these bomb craters and the corals were thriving and the fish were back. Um, the sharks were still pretty ticked off, so that was one of the areas that we didn't like that much. Uh, but the reality is, is that even things as bizarre and obscene as nuclear detonations allowed corals to come back because of the acute nature of the stressor. These are typically what we see today, including in places like Maui. Um, the upper left-hand side, you can see runoff. Um, that's not the 50-year storm, but that's the 15-minute rainfall. This is one of my sites on Guam. Upper right-hand panel, something that we're very familiar with in the Hawaiian Islands is overfishing in the main Hawaiian Islands, especially the things like Uhu, which are critically important to keeping uh, fleshy algae in check. The lower left-hand panel is a sewer outfall. And I can claim uh, one of my things that I do is I dive sewer outfalls. I don't know why, but all throughout the Pacific Islands, they said, hey, Bob, will you come to our island and dive our sewer outfall? Um, I have every single one except Coast Rye, because when I was there, the waves were too big. So I will be publishing a picture book on the sewer outfalls of Micronesia, bound to be a bestseller, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> um, but what's important about these is that it's a freshwater effluent, and it surfaces 100% of the time. And the laws that go on in the Pacific Islands, like Hawaii, and Guam and American Samoa are the ones that say that a, uh, a sewer discharge needs to be in at least 60 feet of water, which off of New York is two miles offshore, which in the case of Guam is literally a stone throw from the reef. So this plume surfaces 100% of the time, and when there's an onshore breeze, it comes right up to the reef where people are fishing and kids are swimming. And what you can see is the cloud. What you don't see are things like estrogenic compounds from unmetabolized birth control pills, which come out in large amounts, and the estrogen, estradiol 17 beta, which is what really comes out, um, is actually the chemical cue that corals use for spawning and many fish use for spawning. So think of an animal in the ocean trying to figure out when it should be spawning, and then it gets these chemicals that are interfering with the signals that are so critical to the ability of these species to continue over time. Um, there's a variety of personal care products. I'm sure you've heard about um, the sunscreen issue. Um, Maui has been one of the interesting places for that as well. But we have a rogues gallery of chemicals that are going on there. Now, we have a pretty well-equipped laboratory, but I assure you that if you go into your medicine cabinet or to your bathroom, you probably have more toxic chemicals in your uh, makeup and your shampoo and other things than we keep in our laboratory on a regular basis. And these are things people are not aware of, but these are things that truly are affecting the coastal environment. And then there are recreational impacts, and I don't have to tell anybody on Maui about those either. So first and foremost, it's un important to understand that corals are living creatures. And I'll just take a moment to talk about how coral reefs persist over time. And it's through the dual processes of reproduction, the formation of new individuals from prior stock, and then recruitment. New things that are formed have to be able to join the reef. So in this first panel, uh, this is a daytime spawning of a coral. It's not that it's out of focus, but that cloud is actually egg and sperm being released by that coral, 7 o'clock in the morning on a reef in Okinawa, three days after the summer full moon. We can predict the day of coral spawning and the time of coral spawning, usually within five minutes, 10 years in advance. Um, we've been doing this for a while. It's not anything that's going to make us a lot of money or make us famous, but we can do it. Um, because we know when corals spawn, we have this great system in which to work to understand why it is that some coral reefs are doing well and other coral reefs are not. If all goes well, this is what really comes out. The orange bodies that you see are coral eggs. 
Uh, the white that you see around them are coral sperm. And it turns out that most corals are what we call simultaneous hermaphrodites. Um, if you know anything about Greek mythology, Hermes was a messenger god, kind of a studly guy. Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty, you put their two names together, Hermes and Aphrodite, and you get the term hermaphrodite. And if you ever wondered what those symbols are, the circle with an arrow coming out of the top is Hermes' sword. Um, the circle with a cross on the bottom that you sometimes see on bathrooms is Aphrodite's mirror. So there's Greek mythology thrown in with coral reproduction tonight. And these hermaphroditic corals then often package their egg and sperm together. And it's a good reason for doing that because most of these corals are at depth and they're not at the same place at the same time. So in order for this to work, the egg and sperm need to come together, and the way they do that is they rendezvous at the surface of the ocean. Uh, the eggs are full of fat or lipid, like oil on water, it flows to the top, and they carry the sperm up as well, which is critically important. So the first question is, if their egg and sperm are packed together, don't they simply self-fertilize? The answer is no. Generally, our laboratory looks like a buffet table during coral spawning. We have all the flavors of egg in one row, all the flavors of sperm in another, and then we mix and match to see what happens. If we take sperm from the same colony from which we collected the egg and reintroduce them, we get less than 2% fertilization. If we take sperm from another colony of the same species, we get up to 95% fertilization. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the eggs are capable of identifying the genetics of a single sperm. And what does that make us wonder is if you have an oil spill, if you have a sewer outfall, if you have sediment and even fresh water in the ocean, since these egg and sperm float to the surface, which is where the fresh water will be, it's the most polluted part of any ocean in the coastal area. And what we've been able to document is year after year and year of uh, failure of reproduction during these very limited spawning events. And since most corals may reproduce for a 20 minute period once a year, you can imagine that if there's a rainstorm that night or if there's any kind of event, reproduction fails for that year. And if you get several years of this in a row, which we've documented, then the reef goes into decline and there's nothing to bring the reef back. However, if everything does go well, if the water quality is good and the right egg and sperm can come together, um, we get this thing that's an embryo. Um, it's less than a millimeter in diameter that within anywhere from 12 to 72 hours would develop into a fully uh, ready coral larvae called a planula, a coral seed. And if all goes well, they'll be able to settle and metamorphose the same way that a caterpillar can metamorphose into a butterfly. This little pear-shaped object can settle and get a good chemical cue, and then it will develop into the first polyp. And eventually, for most corals, uh, they are truly solar powered. They possess little single unicellular algae inside of their tissue, and over 90% of what a coral needs on a daily basis for food comes through photosynthesis from this really beautiful symbiosis. So what you're looking at are six chemically mediated steps in the chain, and if any one of these is broken, then reproduction fails, there's no new material to come back and reseed the reef, and then when corals die for any number of reasons, which they will naturally, um, then you lose reefs and you don't have anything coming back again. So a lot of our initial work focused in on coastal water quality, and there's a lot of work going on with uh, West Maui watersheds. Uh, we went and talked to some people here. The watershed program run by the Maui Nui Marine Resource Council um, with uh, Tova Calendar, um, with Ridge to Reef, and uh, Coral had a group here as well. Uh, for the high islands like those in Hawaii, uh, watershed issues are incredibly important. Whatever you use on land today ends up in the ocean tomorrow, and anything that ends up in the ocean will have an effect on the ability of coral reefs to persist through these dual processes of reproduction and recruitment. What's also important to understand is on here, where that uh, coral larva had settled, um, they don't simply randomly settle, and if they picked a good place, they survive, and if they picked a bad place, they don't. They actually select their site for um, metamorphosis. And the way they do that is by tasting. Um, it turns out that many coral and algae, these pink uh, algae that uh, they're a little bit like um, plaster of Paris, but pink in color, uh, host bacteria that give them the chemical cue. Coral larvae don't have eyes, they can't see where to settle, but they have a very good sense of taste to be able to pick up on the bacteria that indicates to them that's the appropriate place to settle. You can imagine once again that if there's toxicants and pollutants in the water, it interrupts the ability of coral larvae to be able to get the right chemical cue, and even if you were to produce millions of larvae, 
if they can't settle, it's as if reproduction never worked. So it's not only a matter of getting corals to successfully release their gametes on time for the egg and sperm to be able to come together, um, to be able to fertilize and let the larvae develop, but if the larvae can't interact with the appropriate film on the bottom, they simply won't become part of the reef. And this is one reason. Um, you don't need to have a PhD in a laboratory to tell you what's wrong with this picture. No coral larvae could ever settle and metamorphose under these conditions. And unfortunately, in places like Maui, this is one of my study sites in Palau, but you could show this for Oahu, for Kauai, for Maui, and we see this all the time. So whenever you have a situation like this, we know that that reef is dying and will never, ever, ever, ever recover until we reverse this trend. So the way in which we traditionally do coral reef monitoring and to assess what's going on on a reef is to go down and put meter squared quadrats or we can run transects, we can do it photographically or we can do it by hand. But the main indicator um, of change is usually death, meaning are we losing coral cover did we go from 80% coral cover to two? Um, are we losing species? Are we losing key uh, fish? And death is not a good mortality uh, indicator of mortality, or stress, I should say. Uh, meaning that if we used death as the indicator that we had stress in people, we wouldn't be arguing about Obamacare six years later. Meaning that if I come home after a really bad day and I give my wife a kiss and she goes, how you doing, dear? I said, I feel stressed and then I fall over dead. Chances are I should have intervened a little bit earlier. So what do we do with people? We do blood tests, we do cholesterol, we do blood pressure, we do a variety of things so that we can detect stress before it becomes a death event. So the question I and my colleagues began to ask, can we actually do a better job uh, in understanding coral stress before things die? And this is really the guidance of our laboratory is that mortality is a rather crude indicator of stress. So can we intervene beforehand where management can actually make a difference? And this is where this comes from. So I see some people in the audience who might know who the guy is on the left. Who's the guy on the left? Rex Harrison, okay. I talk to a lot of schools and students, they haven't a clue. All right, when I say Dr. Doodlittle, they know it's the guy on the right, Eddie Murphy. They're actually related, they're cousins once removed. At least that's what the DNA says. In any case, I was fascinated with Dr. Doodlittle as a kid, and that really has had an impact on the work that I do. So what could Dr. Doodlittle do? Okay, everyone says talk to the animals because that's what Rex Harrison sang. I have two dogs and I talk to them a lot. Don't chew on the cat. Don't chew on my Zoris. Don't do this. No difference whatsoever. So there's a big difference to talking to animals. He could listen to animals. And I like to point out, especially to my students, that in communication in general, listening is often very different than talking. And for those of us that have been married, I just had my 25th wedding anniversary, listening is really, really more important than talking. So what was cool about Dr. Doolittle is he had this ability to listen to corals. And for those of you that have been around Hawaii for a while, you may know of somebody, Eddie Kamai, who did this really wonderful video called Listen to the Forest. People are used to that. You can go to the forest, you don't need to see the bird to know that it's there because you hear its call. And that's basically, um, uh, Silent Spring, Rachel Carlson's famous book, was about what happens if spring comes and you don't hear birds, and that was tied to the pesticide DDT that was killing birds and killing insects at the time. Well, can you actually listen to a coral? The answer is yes, and actually you can actually listen to a coral reef. A good coral reef should sound like downtown Manila at rush hour. It should be this cacophony of noise. Uh, there should be snapping shrimp, there should be fish, there should be a variety of things going on. And I actually work with traditional fishers in the Pacific who can go to a reef with their eyes closed and they can tell you the state of the reef from 100 meters away. They can tell you which fish are there, which fish are not. And so using this idea, um, this is something from a workshop we actually taught through the Maui Nui Marine Resource Council here on environmental forensics. These are all Dr. Doolittle moments. In the upper left-hand panel, that's not a chia pet, um, that's a coral uh, that's now covered with algae, and it's a very important Dr. Doolittle moment. It's telling us that A, there are a lot of nutrients in the water because the algae is going very quickly, and B, that the area is overfished, particularly of herbivorous fish, meaning that somebody threw out the lawnmowers. And this coral will never, ever, ever, ever recover until we switch that. Uh, in the upper right-hand panel, you can't see it quite as clearly, but here's this little red thing here and here. And that's a uh, trapezia, excuse me, it's um, a porcelainic crab, not trapezia, um, with its claws out. Uh, they live symbiotically with this coral, and they protect it from the crown of thorn starfish. 
Um, if a crown of thorns tries to climb onto this coral, uh, these crabs will come out and begin ripping at the two feet and tear at the stomach of the um, crown of thorns starfish. And if you never saw a starfish gallop, they can actually do so. If they try to climb on and they start getting bit like that, they can haul and when they get away from the coral. So we use this as another Dr. Doodle moment that if we see that coral, which has the shrimps and crabs as obligate symbionts, and we don't see the shrimps and crabs, we know that it's likely a pesticide. And why is that? Is because crabs and shrimp are in the same group as cockroaches and mosquitoes and flies. And if there are pesticides in the water, the crabs and shrimp will die way before the coral will. So again, since I do a lot of work with traditional fishers um, throughout the Pacific, they know this coral, they know the symbiosis, and they can go around and look at the corals and tell me whether or not they see the crabs and shrimp, but they don't. We have a little red flag for pesticide issue. In the lower left-hand panel is a um, feather duster worm, Sibelid, and these can only live in water that has a lot of particulate organic carbon. If you see a shift and they start showing up, it means that water quality is being created. There's a lot of particles that you would normally see. And then finally on the lower right-hand panel, you can see a coral larva that's settled. Where it settles is also very indicative. One, if they do show up, and number two, are they on horizontal surfaces or vertical surfaces or under surfaces? That'll tell us something about sedimentation. Um, there's a lot of other things that we can look for. In the upper panel, you see those little volcanoes. Uh, those are from something called Palyanassa. It's a shrimp that lives in the sediment. They're very important in recycling nutrients. If you see a sand bottom and you don't see these, especially in coral reef area, you know something seriously wrong. Uh, there's probably heavy metals and other toxicants in the sediment. In the uh, lower left panel, you can see the um, footprints of a hermit crab. And on the right hand side, you can see lots of things that are there. You won't see them during the daytime, but you will see them at night. So a reef looks much different at nighttime than it does during the day. And that's caused a lot of things that are nocturnal. And so uh, we see this happening with things like environmental consultants all the time. They'll go out and do a daytime survey and say, oh, we didn't see anything. And you go back to the same place at night, you'll see hundreds of species that come out of the sediment because they're nocturnal instead of diurnal. Um, again, we can look at what happens when corals look like they're in trouble. These four panels on the left-hand side, Primothorn starfish, so we know why the white skeleton is exposed. Um, that starfish ate away the living tissue. Upper right-hand panel is due to disease, and that black line is called black band disease. So immediately we can tell there's a water quality issue, and this is very common in the Caribbean now. In the lower left-hand side, we see coral bleaching. Uh, we've had it very badly in the Hawaiian Islands over the last few years with major bleaching events occurring due to elevated seawater temperatures tied to global climate change. And the one on the lower right-hand panel is actually good news. The white you see there are due to parrotfish uh, bite marks. It shows that there's a lot of herbivory going on there. Parrotfish are looking for algae. And of the four panels there, one is good news, three are very bad news. Finally, we can do other things like look at the size and age of corals. In the upper left-hand panel, while that doesn't look like a beautiful reef, it does to me because that area had corals that were dying back and the living tissue was about the size of a quarter. Um, when there was some watershed remediation that went in, now the fact that they're looking like softballs and cantaloupe shows that that's all new growth and regrowth of those corals. So once again, um, things can be a little bit deceptive if you don't know the history. In the right-hand corner, upper right-hand, we can see a slab taken through a coral. They have annual growth bands the same way trees do, so we can use those for retrospective analysis and determine what years were big rainfall, when a hurricane might have come through, when we had a major bleaching event. It's all recorded. And if you have um, an 800-year-old coral, you can actually tell what happened 800 years ago. Olawalu has some of the oldest corals in the main Hawaiian Islands. And unfortunately, many of the old corals in Olawalu recently died during the last bleaching event. And that's a terrible loss. Lower left-hand corner, we can see a cohort of young corals that came in and settled. This was after a major bleaching event in Palau. Everything there is three or four years old. And we saw an incredible increase in coral cover with a group of larvae that came in from a good site and began to reseed. So that's a reef that's in recovery mode. And then in the lower right-hand side, we can see competitive interactions. Corals are actually very aggressive. You look at them and they don't look very dangerous, but they are to the things around them. And corals can actually use stinging cells and poisonous chemicals to get space. If you think 
real estate's expensive in Maui. Uh, your reefs are actually harder because uh, everything's battling out for the available space, and we can look at these competitive interactions. So the one in the upper right-hand corner is a great diagnostic tool to look over decades and centuries and even a few years ago. And so we focused in on trying to get things down to days, weeks, months, and years. And I'll give a little bit of a history then of how we did this work and how we brought it to Maui. Uh, this is Monolua Bay in Oahu. Um, it's over by um, uh, out a little bit to the east uh, near Port Lock and Hawaii Kai. Um, what used to be one of the largest fish ponds in the main Hawaiian Islands is now a marina. That's the Hawaii Kai Marina. And so a few years ago, um, a community in Monolua Bay was very interested in improving the quality of their reefs. Uh, first, they said, well, we're just going to make it a large MPA and close all fishing, and everything will be fine. And that's when I was dragged into it from a colleague of mine who works on marine protected areas saying, Bob, we need some serious science here. So when we met with the community, there was a consensus that everyone wanted the bay to be in better shape. There's about 60,000 stakeholders uh, that use or live around Monolua Bay, and the bay had really gone into decline. At low tide, there's a lot of algae. It really stinks. There's hardly any fish. The corals are mostly dead. So the idea for most of the landowners who own beautiful homes right on the beach, multi-million dollar homes, was, well, let's stop fishing, make it a large marine protected area, and everything will be great. And the reason I was brought in to tell them the bad news, that no, that's not going to make any difference whatsoever. You could stop fishing tomorrow, and 100 years from now, nothing would be better until you deal with all the runoff from the watersheds that are impacting the bay. So we had a discussion. They agreed to take the MPA off, which was very important because the fishing community then became part of the solution rather than fighting against it. And through our work, we were able to do a number of things. So the upper left-hand panel is showing um, five sites uh, the green site is the one closest to the watershed discharge uh, near an area called Kuleo'o. Uh, the orange is the middle of the channel, the two blue sites on the outside. And what we can see uh, from these sites is that corals in these areas are all living, and that's when we started to do our Dr. Doolittle diagnostics. We took little bits of tissue from the coral, and we analyzed it for protein expression. And in the lower right-hand corner, what you can see is what we call a canonical correlation analysis. Don't say that three times fast. Um, but what it's showing is that each of these sites has coral, and each of the corals are expressing different proteins. And these proteins are just as diagnostic in corals as they are in people. So here's where CSI comes in. If somebody is dead and they end up on the table, it's uh, uh, either NCIS or CSI, uh, one of the first things they'll do is take a blood test. And what they're looking for are things like liver enzymes. Um, same thing if you just take a new medication. If you see any commercial on TV for Lipitor or any medication, they'll say a simple blood test will tell you if it's safe. And what they're looking for are liver enzymes because your liver is your detoxification center. When you take something that you're having a toxic reaction to, uh, bilirubin, other liver enzymes will be brought up. Um, just a little bit of a uh, twist here. Uh, learning science as a kid is very valuable. I hate liver. I always hated liver. And my mom used to feed us liver. And when I was seven years old, I learned enough about liver that I went off on her one night and said, why would you do this to your children? Would you feed us an oil filter? That's exactly what you're doing to your kids. How dare you? And she freaked out and never fed us liver again. So it shows why learning science at an early age is a good thing. Um, so what we're looking for are basically liver enzymes. And the enzyme that we look for um, has a couple of names. We call them xenobiotic metabolizing enzymes. It just means pollutant. That's what a xenobiotic is. And what we see is that it's really high in the corals closest to shore. When we went to the middle one, that's the orange circle, um, there's a lot of invasive algae there. And so at nighttime, the oxygen levels plummet. During the day, plants photosynthesize. At night, they suck down the oxygen. And all the corals there are stressing out due to low oxygen levels. And this is right where the bottom is, where the algae are. And it suffocates any new seed that could come in and settle. Simply couldn't survive. We expected there to be these kinds of changes inshore. And the kinds of proteins we saw there were things like superoxide dismutase. It's a way under oxidative stress of being able to protect the cells from suffocating. Or in very high light, high light levels, we call them reactive oxygen species. It's a way of corals getting burned out by too much oxygen. The one thing that surprised us was this blue area is the fact that the two outer areas in Mauna Lua Bay, uh, we got a protein for DNA damage. 
and we couldn't figure out what was going on. We figured this was mostly oceanic and we couldn't figure out what could possibly be going on. It's far enough from the watershed discharge that we didn't think it was coming from near the marina or near that part of the land. So I started talking to the fishermen and the others who had been using Mauna Lua Bay for quite a while and said, what is it about Portlock? Um, that's the homes that are uh, to the right of those two blue um, circles. And they kind of shrugged and said, I don't know, every house there has a swimming pool, and when they drain their swimming pools, it all goes down to the ocean. And lo and behold, chlorine and bromine cause DNA damage. So we were now able to start tapping into the wealth of information uh, that's held within the coral cells to do this Dr. Do little moment. They can actually tell us what's ailing them. And another good part about using this technique is we can look at the site. So the very first site all the way to the left is from Maui. That's La Perouse, which is just down the road. And so we were looking for a reference site, a site that doesn't have much development around it, not much housing, not much watershed discharge. And so La Perouse was the place we sampled these corals. And you can see that their expression of the protein for detoxification is extremely low. Then if we go from left to right, um, the very high bar at the first site, that's the one closest to shore. And as you go from left to right, we go from near shore to offshore. So that was very cool for us trying to use these techniques because we call this dose dependence. The more stress you have, the closer to shore you are, uh, the more protein expression you have. This is good news for the coral because they're all alive. They haven't died, but we can tell already that the corals inshore are under much more stress than they are offshore, and all the corals in Mauna Lua Bay are much more stressed than the corals in La Perouse. It's all the same species. So this becomes a tool now that can be used as either the carrot or the stick. We can work with the communities there to say, you know, your cholesterol is 280 you need to get that cholesterol down. We have actual numbers that we can go to. So if I go to my doctor every year for my yearly physical and she says, you know, Bob, your cholesterol is 280, you know, cut out the beer and pizza, I want you to run three days a week, come back in two months. If I go from 280 to 220, then we know that that intervention is working. And she'll say, okay, great, 220 is great, you did this change, good for you, we really need to get to 180. How are we gonna eke that last bit out? And I go, why did you just say it in the first place? So <laughs> in any case, what we can do then, the same with corals. We're at this very high level. We need to get to La Perouse. How do we do that? Well, let's start working on watersheds. Let's cut down on the pesticide use. Let's work on um, things that have been used in the past that might be legacy. Let's start holding water on land and keep the sediment out of the water. And what we can see is an improvement or not. And the way you can use it as a stick is this actually will hold up in court. And as much as I hate doing science in a courtroom, it's a terrible, terrible place uh, to do science because it's not about truth, it's about the best argument. I have taken these techniques to court uh, on a ship grounding case. It was Tobacco Industry 101. A ship ran aground in the island of Yap in the Western Pacific. Lots of corals died. Uh, 85,000 gallons of fuel oil were spilled on the reef. Mangroves died, corals died. And the uh, insurance company and their experts came in and said, yes, we ran aground, and yes, we spilled oil, and yes, corals died, but you can't prove that it was our oil. And this is, you know, yes, your grandfather smoked five packs of cigarettes a day, and yes, he died of lung cancer, but you can't prove, remember that? It's called Manufactured Uncertainty in a very good book um, about um, manufactured uncertainty, which is an entire, uh, discipline now of people that are hired to use science to obfuscate rather than clarify. And so what we did was went back to the biomarkers and asked the corals that survived what was wrong and we were able to prove that the only way that uh, those proteins could be upregulated is due to uh, fuel oil and it held up in court and went through all three appeals and now it's part of case law. So. You know, for the managers at NOAA who funded this research, they said peer review publication is great, so we did the peer review publication, but their ultimate goal was, as a manager, we're concerned with, will it hold up in court? And the answer is yes, it did. So these techniques are proven, they're getting better all the time. Um, this doesn't need any explanation, it's pretty self-explanatory, uh, <laughs> so I won't go in there, all right. So here's where we start nerding out, don't panic, okay? The only molecular science you need to understand for this one is if you can tell the difference between blue and green. And if you're colorblind, then you better learn molecular biology because you can't do it any other way. Uh, this is what's called a KEG pathway diagram. It stands for the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Gene and Genomes. And it's an incredible database that basically shows all the metabol metabolic pathways in a living organism. It doesn't matter if it's a human, a monkey, a coral, or a sea cucumber. These are all the things that animals do. And it turns out that corals have the exact same proteins that we have, and they can do it too. 
So on this blank diagram, we started asking questions like, what if we take a coral from a low stress environment, outer part of Mauna Loa Bay, and move it inside the bay and then see what happens? And everything you see in blue is lighting up of proteins that were upregulated. The way we look at proteins is kind of like a bilge pump on a boat, that the boat's afloat, and as water begins to leak into the boat, at some point that bilge pump will kick on. And the boat will stay afloat as long as the pump is able to pump water out faster than it's coming in. So that's what the proteins are doing now. They're pumping, they're getting things out so that the coral doesn't sink, it's still alive. You get to some threshold point where the water's coming in faster than the pump can push it out, and that's when the ship sinks, and that's what these proteins do. They have a function, and that's what genes do if you think of Bio 101, or even if you didn't take Bio 101. We all have chromosomes, our chromosomes have genes, and the genes do two things. They run processes like respiration, like reproduction, like all of the th processes we do. And genes can also make products. They can make hair for some people. They can make <laughs> eyeballs. They uh, determine what color you have for your eyes and for your skin and your hair, things of that nature. And so what these genes are able to do is turn on and turn off depending upon what they're needed. And what they do is they're the ones that determine the expression of protein. So now we have this great tool where we can go to these pathways and what was interesting, when we took the offshore corals and moved them in, they freaked out. You can see all these metabolic, uh, metabolic pathways that were turned on. And if we look at things like 270 proteins were turned on um, compared in the outer ones, compared to 147 that were turned on when we took a nearshore coral and moved it out. So this is called a common garden experiment. It's one way of testing the coral. The corals inside are already used to a lot of stress. When we moved them outside, they loved it. If you look, you just hardly see any green, just a few places where they changed protein expression. And elevating certain proteins may not be a bad thing. It may actually be a good thing. It might say, okay, instead of just putting energy into growth, we can now start making proteins for reproduction. So in all animals, the first thing you do is survive. If survival is going well, then you can grow. And then at some point, if you have additional energy, you can put that into reproduction in the case of coral. And what these proteins are telling us is when we move the inside corals out, they started loving it and they could start doing things that they couldn't do when they were highly stressed. The outside coral moved in, totally freaked out, and we can start looking at what parts of that diagram lit up. The ones for detoxification, so that's no surprise. There were a lot of pollutants in the water. That's your pesticide and oil signals. We could start looking at the ability to even run their metabolism was under great stress, so they're upregulating proteins so they don't fall apart. Proteins start breaking down under stress. Uh, we could look at things like their ability to respire. They were putting so much energy into detoxification that they're having trouble processing sugar and adding new tissue to the coral as well. So these are wonderful diagrams to tell us what's going on. And so we started to do work here um, for, uh, on, core, on different kinds of stressors back in the laboratory to see if we could show a correlation between a potential toxicant or a, a known toxicant and what it did in corals. And here we can see uh, Roundup. Some of you may be familiar with that. That's an herbicide very much used here. Glyphosate is the chemical. Um, PCBs, uh, we still have issues that are legacy from old transformers. And atrazine, which is again probably the number one um, pesticide we see showing up in water samples around Hawaiian Islands. Atrazine is a particularly well-known chemical. Tyrone Hayes, a faculty member at UC Berkeley, did instrumental studies showing it caused feminization in male uh, amphibians like frogs. Uh, male frogs were forming ovaries. And so when a male forms ovaries, it's no longer reproductive. So it's causing mass sterilization. It was doing other unique things like forming additional limbs. Instead of having two front legs and two rear legs, it would have five legs. And so atrazine is kind of a very nasty chemical. And so uh, that's one of the ones that we're working with as well to see if it affects corals because corals, as we talked about, are hermaphrodites. If they're exposed to chemicals, we don't know if their endocrine system works the same. Um, so we're asking the question, we'll be using that. And what's really interesting here is we start to look at how these proteins interact. 
Uh, certain proteins we can identify from atrazine, certain from PCBs, and certain from Roundup. So by doing this under very controlled conditions in laboratory, we know which proteins to look for. Then we can go back out into the field and then ask the corals. Now we have a yardstick with which we can measure them. Are you turning on the proteins that are indicative of um, things like Roundup or atrazine? And the reason why that's so important, and I know we have people here doing water quality monitoring, um, it's really important to do monitoring, but it's also a little bit problematic. Meaning that if I take a water sample at 9 o'clock this morning, I can guarantee you it'll be different at 4 o'clock this afternoon. It has to do with the tide. It has to do whether it rained or not. So that the trouble with water quality alone is it's very ephemeral. And the other problem with water quality monitoring, and again, it's really important to have those numbers, but just because a chemical is present doesn't mean it's biologically relevant. You can have levels of chemicals that are out there. They're not doing anything. And the other problem is that you can meet all of your criteria for copper and arsenic and gasoline and pesticide, and everything is still wrong because it's not the individual ingredients, but it's the soup. When you put them all together, it has a toxic effect where each one of them is still within the allowable limits. So by having these new ways of doing things, we can look at what proteins are tied to detoxification, which are antioxidant problems, uh, which are affecting the ability of coral cells to divide. So now we can really do Dr. Doolittle at a, a level we could never do before. And again, we can look at our keg diagram. So if we start exposing corals to things like Roundup, we know which pathways light up, and we can understand metabolically what it's doing. And we can do the same thing with other chemicals like PCBs. These are the ones that just went off the chart. When you expose living organisms to PCBs, everything lights up. All of the metabolic pathways get into trouble. And then you're back to the issue of the um, bilge pump. At what point can the proteins no longer be effective in detoxifying the effect? And that's when the organisms actually die. But the good news is by using these tools and techniques, we can identify stress before it becomes an issue. Am I too close? Oh, no, is that different? I thought it was the... Oh, it's the AC. Oh, it's the AC. I thought it was the uh, speaker. And so where does this come to Maui then? Um, so we've been working as part of a group. Uh, a lot of this is funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, again in collaboration with Maui Nui Marine Resource Council and other colleagues. And what we have here is uh, some of the West Maui watershed areas that are very well defined. And that's actually good to work with because you pretty well know what's going on within a watershed. And the corals that are right off of that watershed can tell you what are the things that are concerned that you need to target. So here, uh, one of the reefs, uh, we have main sites now at um, uh, Wahikuli, uh, Honokawai, uh, we started in Olawalu, and what we're seeing, is that the mic, or is that just the AC? That, oh, okay. the AC stuff. <laughs> no problem. And so here are my students, uh, they get to do all the diving, I get to sit behind a desk and write reports and write uh, proposals, and they're collecting corals, and all we do is we take a one centimeter circle of coral tissue, um, which doesn't really, doesn't harm the coral at all. And that's all we need to be able to do the work on both the protein expression, the proteomics, and also to do the genetic work on understanding what's going on genetically that's producing the genes that either allow a coral to survive or not. And when we're done, we just take a little bit of either plaster of Paris or clay, cover up the um, little uh, lesion that's there, and that's actually one of the tests that we use to see how healthy a coral is, is when we take this one centimeter plug, we look at how the amount of time it takes for that coral area to recover. We call it lesion repair. If a coral is stressed, um, it takes a long time or the lesion may not recover. Um, if the coral is in good shape, then it recovers very quickly. And anybody who has kids knows that kids heal very quickly. If they didn't, we wouldn't have adults. And so it's the same thing that you notice that younger things actually heal faster than older things. So I've heard. And so um, by using these techniques then, uh, we have sites that we've been comparing. So uh, the lower area, you recognize that's Maui there. And so we have Honokawai and Wahikuli. And that's an area separated by about uh, five kilometers. And then we have inshore and offshore. So we have paired sites on Maui. And then we also have paired sites in Monolua Bay near shore and offshore. Uh, so we have the ability to compare Wahikuli versus Honokawai, then inshore versus offshore, and then Maui versus Oahu. And what we found was really interesting. So the one on the left frame <clears throat> is Maui. And what we found was that there was not only a difference in protein expression between nearshore and offshore, which is what we expected, that was the effect of more pollutants and more stress inshore than the offshore site, but what surprised the heck out of us was when we compared these things genetically. So it's the genetics of the coral 
that are determining the ability to withstand stress. And I'll put it in perspective for you. Um, Hawaii has some of the typical stressors we talked about, but lo and behold, Hawaii came up with a new stressor that we've never seen anywhere else in the world, and that's called the molasses spill. Anybody remember Matson, the molasses spill in Honolulu Harbor? So a few years ago, we got a molasses spill. I got a call at 7 o'clock in the morning from William Isla, the head of the DLNR at the time, saying, Bob, we need help. We need divers to go into Honolulu Harbor. And my first question is, why? Why in the world did anybody want to dive Honolulu Harbor? And they wanted to know, you know, was there anything in there? And if so, what was affected? And it blew us away. There were incredible coral reefs in Honolulu Harbor. And were is past tense. Um, there were these amazing postaloperative Damocornis reefs, a variety of corals in there, uh, sea cucumbers, crab, shrimp. It was just this incredible, thriving community. And the first question we ask is, why would any self-respecting coral live in Honolulu Harbor? It's a terrible place to live. Um, salinity changes. Every time it rains, all of downtown Honolulu drains into Honolulu Harbor. Salinity, temperature, um, heavy metals from anti-fouling paints arsenic, cadmium, copper, you name it, oil spills. I mean, it's one of the nastiest places on Earth, and yet there were corals thriving there. How did they do it? They were genetically selected for being able to survive in that environment. And uh, some of you may have heard Nerissa Spies give a talk a little while ago on cockroach corals. This was the cockroach coral story. No matter what my students tried to do in the laboratory to kill these things, and believe me, they've tried everything, like leaving a bowl of them under a microscope for three or four weeks and forgetting and letting the water evaporate out until it went from 35 parts per thousand to 85 parts per thousand, and the corals were just fine. Why genetically they were different, and so we started asking the questions, what about Maui? The corals between the near shore and offshore environment at Hona Kauai are genetically different from each other. The corals from near shore uh, Waihikuli are different genetically from inshore and offshore. And in Mauna Loa Bay, genetically, the inshore corals are different than the offshore corals. What took us totally by surprise is that the corals outside in Mauna Loa Bay are very closely related to the outside corals in Waihikuli and Hona Kauai. So 100 kilometers away, they're most closely related genetically than the ones that are 30 meters away. And that's showing us a couple of things. A, the importance of genetics. The particular gene you have, they all have genes to do different things, but it's the form of that gene that makes a big difference. And we know that from human medicine, there are people that have been HIV positive for 25 years and have never shown any immunological suppression whatsoever. Genetically, they can get HIV, but they never have the expression of immune, uh, immunological problems as a result of it. So we know that these corals are very unique, and the fact that over hundreds of kilometers, the corals are more genetically similar to one another, what that's telling us is that the outside corals are more genetically diverse than the inside corals, and we're losing genetic variation in corals, which is very scary. Um, that experiment was run in the 1800s. It was called the Irish Potato Famine. If anyone ever heard of it, uh, a million people died of starvation. A million people left Ireland because they raised one genetic variant of potato that did really, really, really well under the very harsh Irish conditions. But it had no resistance to um, the fungi that came in and wiped out the entire crop. So genetic diversity is critically important. And our concern is one morning we will wake up and a whole bunch of corals will be gone, and we didn't even see it coming because we were asking the wrong question. We were looking at the species diversity, not the genetic diversity within a single species. And as you begin to lose genetic diversity, you begin to lose the ability for populations to survive under a changing world. We don't know what the next uh, major problem will be. In the Caribbean, there are good reefs. I was just in Miami for two meetings in June. There are good reefs at 3% coral cover. Their bad reefs were at 0.05 coral, percent coral cover. I thought they missed the decimal point, and they said no, 3% and 0.05%. Uh, he got hit with a hurricane, got hit with coral bleaching, and then got hit with a big disease outbreak. We've been lucky so far um, that we haven't seen that kind of disease outbreak in Oahu or other main Hawaiian islands yet, but that doesn't mean we're immune from it either. And so I'm not saying that to scare you, but what I am saying is that we need to pay attention to the things that we haven't been paying attention to, and that's genetic diversity. Once again, this is Wahikuli, shallow versus deep, and uh, Honokawai, shallow versus deep. So these techniques, we have to be holier than now. We have to double check everything. The fact that they do come together, um, 
the important thing to recognize is that all of the dark blue with the dark blue rings cluster together. All the light green uh, with the light green uh, with the dark green rings around it show that they're in the same line across the board. What this means is we're seeing consistency in protein expression even in a variety of different corals. And again, when we take a look at Wahi Kuli shallow versus deep, uh, we can see uh, the green is upregulated in the shallow corals. Uh, the blue is upregulated in the deep corals. These corals are surviving in Wahi Kuli, and they're doing quite well because they're doing this protein expression, and their bilge pumps are still more than adequate to keep up with the stressors that are there. So that's the good news, and that's what we're trying to look at now is which are the pathways being lit up and using Dr. Doolittle at the very best. These corals are guiding us and telling us what we need to do on land to be able to reduce the stressors to get them back. Uh, the first thing we're seeing, this is what I think is going on in the Florida corals, when they get stressed to a certain point, they're still alive, but they can't reproduce. And corals that are non-reproductive is like having money in a bank account but no interest, and you have your monthly fees and eventually everything goes to zero. So to finish up then, um, this is Oahu, but you can see this on Maui all the time as well. A rainstorm coming. Uh, we have one of the most efficient systems in the world for killing coastal coral reefs with these concrete runways that go from the mountains to the sea. Um, it's terrible. And so what we need to do is keep water on land, keep the toxicants down, and we've turned water from an asset into a liability. And that's the wrong way to go. So this is an engineering design issue that could be handled. Um, there's an infrastructure that goes with it. This is showing after one rainstorm. It was December 2008, um, we had 20 tons of sediment that were deposited on our second reef site within four to six hours of this rainstorm. Wow. You think about 20 tons of sediment in four to six hours, no reef in the world can survive that. So this is the magnitude of the problem we have with this engineering. And I'll finish up with just a couple of points I want to make. Um, this slide um, is kind of cool looking in colors, but this is my entire research career in one slide. I don't know what it says about me. <laughs> Uh, but my view is if you can't tell people what you're doing in one slide, then you still haven't figured it out. On the x-axis, we have years. And so all the way to the left is the year 1900 to the year 2100. For you on this side, the year 1900 to 2100. Um, where the lines diverge is the year 2009, which was the last year we took data. And on the y-axis, we have percent coral cover. So up this side is percent coral cover with this high number being 80. So this is actually based on real data from 265 Pacific reefs that in the year 1900, uh, there was 80% coral cover mean for these 265 reefs. Um, by the year 2009, it was down to 38%. So 50% of the coral was lost within that period of time. So everything from there on in is modeling. These are projections. And the decade doesn't matter as much as the angle of the line. But if you look at the yellow line, with the, excuse me, let's start with the red line. The red line is if nothing were to change and if everything were to remain constant, uh, we expect all these reefs to be completely uh, destroyed by the year 2070. Again, the decade can change, um, and it's uh, based on a couple things, but primarily on the trajectory. If we add global warming, we get the yellow line, which shows that we go to destruction uh, 10 years earlier. Um, so I started working with a colleague of mine who's a very good modeler, Eric Wolanski at the Australian Institute of Marine Science. And what we have found is in many of our reefs in the Pacific, where we have done good water rest, uh, watershed restoration, um, the green line is showing what happens with land-based sources of remediation. Um, and then the blue line is showing uh, the same, but the turn point uh, by the year about 2050 is what we expected. The green line is with global warming alone. And the blue line is when we add ocean acidification, which we know is occurring anyway. So what this shows us again is all roads lead to destruction of the reef. So my wonderful physical oceanography colleague was, all right, well done, let's go ahead and publish. And I said, no, no way in the world am I going to publish that, because what it tells us is that we're doomed no matter what we do. And so he goes, yeah, but these are the data. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. We need to do one more model of what happens if we get our act together at the local level on watershed issues, and what if we get our act together globally on climate change? And he kind of rolled his eyes, oh, damn biologist, okay. So we did the final model, and that's the purple line, and these are based on real modeling data, that if we do watershed restoration and protection today, we buy time. But if we don't get global climate change under control, we lose it. You can argue if it's 2050, 2030, 2070, you can argue any way you want to, and we can do that if you want. But the most important one to me is the purple line, 
And that's why when I tell people that coral reefs are threatened but not doomed. Uh, we held an international coral reef symposium. It was at the Hawaii Convention Center in 2016. Um, I was the organizer for that. I will never do that again. Um, but we had 2,500 scientists and managers and educators and stakeholders from 97 nations. And there was a consensus, which was amazing to me, uh, that the consensus statement that came out of the meeting was exactly that. Coral reefs are threatened but not doomed, and it's totally up to us. We can make decisions today about what we do to control local stressors. And with buying that time, if we act effectively, we can also deal with climate change. And as I like to tell people, personally, I'm an optimist. Otherwise, I can't get out of bed in the morning. Professionally, I'm a pragmatist. Otherwise, I can't do my job. But as both the pragmatist and the optimist, I do believe that the purple line is possible. And I say that not only as a scientist, but I say that as a parent. Nothing on that graph is acceptable to me other than the purple line. So what do I do and what do we do as a community to ensure that that's the purple line that leaves a legacy of vital reefs for the future? The way we do it is I like to look at things in the way of food. Who doesn't? And so science needs to be a main course when we talk about policy. And I actually do a fair amount of work at that intersection between science and policy. It should be kind of the front. And when I say science, I have deep respect for the social sciences because coral reef management is a misnomer. You don't manage coral reefs. Corals are going to do whatever they damn well please, and we know that. Um, what you can do are manage the human activities responsible for coral reef decline, and that's the target we look for. So social sciences, biosciences, bringing culture, economics, and eventually you get to politics, that all of these are necessary to come up with good information for good decision making. And I'm a firm believer if the community will lead, the leaders will follow. And that requires good partnerships. <laughs> and some of the people I work with are people that I never, ever would have thought about working with before. Um, truly cats and dogs. I actually collaborate with people in the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, I had a couple of times where we almost came to blows, and now I work with them as colleagues. So anything is possible in the world. And at that point, I'll simply say thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. it take to do a metabolic pathway analysis? The question was how long does it take to do a metabolic pathway analysis? Um, it takes one field trip to Maui to collect the corals, two days. Um, it takes uh, about three or four days to process it and then it goes off to a lab. We use liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, LCMS, and it all depends on what their backlog is. <laughs> so the run actually takes about three hours. Um, it all depends on how many people are in front of us, but we can actually turn around the data now um, from the data collection until we get the pathways back. Once we get the LCMS data, we just run it through a database and we get the answer within 20 minutes. So it's just a matter of logistics and then lab work. Um, we have literally one of the few CSI laboratories in the world for coral reefs. There's about four of us. And so what we're trying to do is network effectively. Um, when you go to a doctor and get a blood test, um, they don't do the blood test analysis there. They give it to diagnostic laboratories. They drive around in their little car three or four times a day. What we're trying to do is the same thing with this to bring it to scale so that we can make this as a real management tool. But basically, if everything went well, we could turn around the data within a couple of weeks. And then follow how much does that cost for that one Right now, so the cost of coming to Maui and collecting the samples, so that's, you know, airfare from, uh, from Oahu, uh, hotel stays so that they don't get bent flying back that night. Um, each sample we run through the LCMS is $250 a sample. And like other things, uh, prices come down, and we can do an economy of scale. When we do one uh, LCMS run on a coral, uh, we can get between three and 4,000 proteins. We're only tapping a little bit of that when we do the keg diagrams if we actually go much deeper. And that's why we're trying to do economies of scale. We're actually working on things like a stick test. Uh, the pregnancy test that people have is a antibody test, and antibodies can show which proteins are there. So we're trying to work with a couple of people in uh, bioengineering to see if we could do like a pregnancy test stick for corals to at least see what the initial proteins are. And then for the more sophisticated work, LCMS is still the way to go. Okay, question. Yes, sir. Uh, there uh, seems to be a lot less watershed funding at the federal and state level than what's needed, uh, even before we saw this presentation. So I'm wondering, have you been in discussions with those kinds of authorities, DOH or EPA, to show them just how connected that watershed component is to the coral? The question was about funding for watershed work. And yeah, it's inadequately funded. 
And so this is one of the things that requires infrastructure. Um, I serve as one of the science advisors to the U.S. Coral Reef Task Force, which is all the federal line agencies in the executive branch, and they're well aware of the issue. Land-based source of pollution is considered one of the big three, along with overfishing and climate change, and that's the issue, is that um, you want to front end it. And so on construction activities, um, every house should have water catchment. Um, there are so many ways in a world of climate change that for Oahu, and I would say the same for Maui, um, with climate change, temperature, the two degree, which is an underestimate, means that the condensation point for clouds is going to raise about 800 feet. And that means the clouds are not going to be hitting the mountains. They're going to be going over the coal allows. They're going to be missing some mountains here. Our rainfall is expected to drop by at least 40%, possibly 60%. Every time the road is dug up, and I don't know what it's like in Maui, but I have never been on Kalaniani Highway on Oahu where it hasn't been dug up somewhere. Every one of those roads when it's dug up should be a collection basin for water running off of land and then you capture it and turn it back from the liability into the asset. So there are a lot of ways that engineering can come in, especially in a world of climate change, that every new development should have underground catchment, everybody should have catchment systems on their homes, and every large road project should have underground cisterns to collect the water so you can use it. Um, if Waikiki and Kihei ever have to go on reverse osmosis, um, it's going to be cost prohibitive. Why in the world don't we just capture the water and keep it out of the ocean and all the stuff that goes with it? So there are ways of doing it, but you're absolutely right. Right now it's underfunded. <coughs> Questions? Yes, sir. I might have one of your slides, I think, that had Roundup and some other chemicals on it had DMT and Roundup. Are those controlled? Yes. Why was DMSO a control? Okay, for those of you that aren't geeks and nerds out there, <laughs> DMSO is a solvent. So many of the chemicals we work with don't dissolve in water. And so in order to run them and expose things to them, we have to do a DMSO solvent. And for that reason, we have to run the control to make sure that anything we see happening is not due to DMSO, it's due to the active chemical that we're exposing the coral to. And that's chemistry, we have to do it. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Yes, we do, sir. On the graph that you showed, the one slide that depicted your career. <laughs> yes. I'm wondering why the research stopped at a certain year, 2009. Okay. The question was on my life slide of everything I've ever done. Um, why did it stop in 2009? That's when we uh, cut the point for doing the modeling. We're still collecting data from those areas as well. Um, but what we did was used all the data up to that point to put into the model. And we actually have data for the last nine years as well. And you know that's what you do in science. You just wait a while and then you republish what you did before. So we'll have an update uh, in about another year. We'll do the 10-year anniversary of that, uh, that graph. In the back, yes. Oh, him. Hey, Mark. Some experts um, talk about the alluvial plain in West Maui and these fine sediments that are going to destroy the reefs. So they say you have to make a choice, either hard engineer the coastline to be protected from eroding alluvial plain uh, sediments and, or not, or, or give up your reefs. That's sort of the choice, and it seems like uh, the county and others are sort of following do you have any comment on, on those <laughs> yeah. In a word, I'll say it's a, force, a false choice. Um, there are many choices in the world. And to break it down to one choice or the other, uh, the question was the alluvial areas off of West Maui, um, whether it's a matter of either uh, protecting the shore or protecting the reefs. You can't have both. Absolutely false. You can have both. What you need to do is look at proper decision making about what the options are. Some of it is engineering. Some of it is uh, reducing the flow that's coming in. And just like checking accounts, um, bays and coastal areas have a dynamic. If there's more coming in that's getting flushed out, it's going to accumulate. And we see that with invasive algae, they hold the sediment in place. Um, it all depends on what the coastal area is like. Is it a closed embayment or is it an open exposed? So depending upon what your site uh, conditions are, there are a variety of tools that are available to not only reduce the load going in, but also to winnow out the material that's there. And so I would argue that there are more choices than either the reef or the coastal area. You can do both, but there is a requirement of funding for infrastructure to go with it. Okay. All right. I know you've been sitting for a long time, so oh, one, one more. So the bottom line, what do we as individuals do to Okay, great question. So what can you do as individuals to save coral? Um, I would say the first thing you can do is make sure you're registered and vote. 
every vote counts. And what you do is you determine who you want making decisions for you. And that's where my comment is that if the community will lead, the leaders will follow. If you, and we have scientists, we have wonderful managers, we have wonderful stakeholders, we have traditional practitioners, we know what the issue is. You don't need me to stand up here and tell you the coral reefs are in trouble. All you have to do is go into the ocean. What we have um, are government that are irresponsible and not listening to either the good solid data that are out there or the needs of the stakeholders or are being selected for by a particular group because of the outcome that they'll bring up. And the best way that a community can do that is get actively engaged as a member of society in bringing these issues to bear and letting people know about it too. And so, you know, we talk about the elevator speech. You know, anytime you have a captive audience, go for it. <laughs> Let other people know about it. Uh, I have no shame whatsoever. Um, I spend a lot of time going to schools, and uh, honestly, my target audience is kindergarten, first grade, second grade. If anyone in the audience has had kids, you know that they're the ultimate vector of every disease known to humankind. They go to school, they get sick, they bring it home. They can do the same with environmental ethic. So if I get a request to go to the legislature and testify, or to go to a kindergarten, I'll usually go to the kindergarten and send a graduate student to the legislature and get those five-year-olds wired up because anybody, again, who knows kids, you're never going to win an argument with a five-year-old on fire. And so uh, that's another way, you know, get to the people who most need to hear it. Those people are not here tonight. And again, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm very grateful to Amy and to the Maui Nui Marine Resource Council for asking me to come and the fact that you showed up. There was free food, so there's good reason. Um, but the idea there is I'm still talking to people who get it, and if I can help empower you with knowledge, and you can say somebody that has a PhD after the name said it, so it must be true. You know, I'm not using alternate truth now, I'm using facts that are based on science. Um, go after the public, go after your family, go after anybody who'll hear you, and then take it to the polls. Because the joy I have in working like this, a lot of my work is in the Pacific Islands for close to 40 years now. When I go to Palau, the first question I'm asked by the traditional leaders, the women's groups, or the elected leaders is what will this decision mean for my children and grandchildren? I go to Washington, D.C. four times a year. I've been doing that for 30 years. Never once in my professional career has anyone in Washington, D.C. ever asked me about intergenerational responsibility. Two years if they're in the House, four years executive branch, six years in the Senate. I'm not being cynical, I'm being pragmatic that that's where the action hits. That if you can get people to recognize that this is intergenerational responsibility and it's quality of life, if you can get to the kids, if you can get to your colleagues and let them know that you can make a difference. And again, you know, I show a lot of stuff here. Don't get depressed, don't get bummed out. The take home message is that purple line is realistic and it can occur. And it's people like you who are willing to take that message around and take it to the polling place that can make the difference. We've seen the, the reefs here degrade over the last 20 years by a lot. Where have you been in the world where they have maintained uh, healthy status? Okay, the question was the reefs in Maui have degraded a lot over the last 20 years. Where have I been where they're doing well? Palau. Guam. Well, Guam got hit pretty hard with the bleaching. Um, Palau is probably the one that I have the most experience. I'm down there at least a few times a year. We have reefs that were completely destroyed, you know, down to 5%, 10% coral cover, uh, 1998 bleaching event, and they're now at 80% coral cover again. So what it showed us is when you remove the stressors, corals are resilient biological communities. They can and will come back. Um, Palau has done some incredible things. Um, they made their entire exclusive, ec exclusive economic zone a sanctuary, 20% which is open for fishing uh, to the local community. Um, they do things like control tourism. Um, I recommended it to uh, Amy. Look online, it's called Palau Pledge. This wonderful two minute video of what Palau is doing. When you come into Palau, you have to sign in your passport the Palau Pledge that you will take care of the environment. If you're coming in an airplane, you have to see the video that tells you to respect their culture and their resources. You could easily do that here in Maui, but it's going to take political will. So the good news, again, is coral reefs are resilient communities. I've seen areas even in Oahu. I worked in Kaneohe Bay starting in 1979. Some of those reefs got really hammered during the bleaching event, and I've gone back to them, and some of them are in really good shape again. The scary part to me is that I can see the coral. What I know already is that's a fraction of the genetic diversity we once had, and now 
there is a committee in which I serve from the National Academies of Sciences talking about interventions, things that I never would have thought about five years ago or now things that are on the table. Um, but there are things, and to misquote The Martian, that movie uh, with Matt Damon, that we're going to have to science the crap out of it. Uh, we can actually bring science to bear, but a lot of it doesn't require serious science. It just requires good stewardship of what we already have. took a trip to Raja Impat. Have you been there, and what, what do you think of the situation there? Is it holding stable, or...? Raja Impat, who's asking about Indonesia. Uh, I haven't been there, but a dear colleague of mine, Chuck Berkeley, was there three weeks ago, and he said that the recovery was going really, really well, that the coral cover is still very strong. And again, we see in areas where you do reduce the sediment, especially those things that are further from shore, um, the ability for recovery is pretty strong. And again, there are other things that we can do um, as a community. We have great managers. DAR, you've got some of the best people in the world here. Uh, Russell Sparks is absolutely wonderful. I see Darla's back, and Darla is DAR. Um, you've got in tremendous talent here, um, but we still have a few bumps in the road uh, back on uh, Oahu. Uh, things like flashlight spear fishing at night. I mean, what's up with that? You know, that's ridiculous. Um, there are things that could be done low hanging fruit, um, but places like Raja and Pat show us that it can get better. Okay, I'll take one more question, then I'll hang around to talk with people. Yes, sir. I was wondering if in Malibu Bay you're making progress, you're meeting with the community, and you're identifying things as it improves. Okay, so the question is are things getting better in um, Malibu Bay? The answer is yes. There have been a number of things that have gone on there. The community is working together. And I do a lot of work with uh, Pacific Islanders and with traditional navigators. And the way I always think now is you pick your destination first, then you figure out how to get there. They did a good job on building consensus. Their destination was making Montalua Bay better. The fishing community is part of the solution. The businesses, the homeowners, there have been watershed restoration activities ongoing, rain barrels. There's a group called Malama Montalua that's very active. They had the great hookie. They uh, removed tons and tons of invasive algae. They were holding the sediment in place. So now the water quality is improving. It's not there yet. There's more infrastructure, but they're making steps in the right direction, and we're actually seeing an improvement as a result of it. So the good news is the time scale we're looking at is within two to three years, if you do improve water quality, you will see a difference. And in a, within five years, it's very notable. And in places like Palau, you know, 10 years after a major bleaching event, you couldn't tell that anything ever, ever happened there. So again, that's the purple line. If we do a good job, and if we reduce stressors and allow coral reefs to naturally recover, they can do so. Okay, why don't we break here, and then I'll hang around as long as people want to talk.